I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 28. In your pew Bibles, it's found on page 1,554. Listen to the word of God from Matthew 28. We will begin reading at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. So we begin in the fall with the B. And who remembers what B stands for? Belonging. I belong, right? And we, we looked at the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer one. Uh, our only comfort in life and in death is that we are not our own but belong. The K which followed it stands for knowledge or knowing. And we move from the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism to the Apostles' Creed. And we did a, a series of sermons in the month of November on knowing God and what that was all about. The H on the bottom there stands for hope. That's a little, well, maybe we didn't make the connection as well. It was the, the Advent series about Ruth longing for, for God to be with us. And we've gotten to this, uh, this newest block, this latest one, C, and uh, as we do see, we're running through a quick review of all the others. We are called to belong, which we saw last week as we welcomed people, to know, as we're talking about this week, uh, looking at the, the Great Commission and some of the other things that uh, led up to it, and finally, next week, hope. We are called to know, and we think about what Jesus commanded his disciples to do as he sent them out to, to baptize and to teach, to teach. Last week we had the baptism. This week we are talking about that whole area of teaching. Excuse me a minute, I, I have to take this. There's something no one has heard near enough of in the last two weeks, right? A school bell. You've, you've all been trapped at home, little ones with big ones, and uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about school, and we're going to, to follow maybe a format that some people are used to from school, and we're going to begin by talking about some of the similarities and differences between church and school. And I guess it's not so hard to, to think of, of, of some of the similarities, and, and I guess the main one is maybe what we're doing right here and right now. It's... It's the whole idea of, of coming to a place to, to, to try and learn. There is someone up front sharing something, and increasingly, especially in, in big uh, mega sorts of churches, the, the person who stands up front and do, does this is known as a teaching pastor. And what that person does is called teaching rather than, than preaching as uh, that shift to uh, a school sort of model is, is uh, uh, adopted uh, as, as you go from uh, different churches to, 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 to bigger churches. But that's about where it ends, right? I mean, that's where the similarity ends. We gather together, someone talks, we try to, to chew on a piece of scripture, learn something about it, apply it to our lives, and, 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 and then the, the dissimilarities begin. Now, as you walked into church this morning, I'm wondering how many of you handed in your homework from last week? Not, not many. Well, you didn't get any homework last week, did you? Come to think of it, you, you, you never really get much homework. There are 
there are suggestions about what you might be able to do, but it's all, it's all pretty much optional. And, and, and not only is there not any homework, there aren't any real tests at the end of a, a period of, of anything. We just kind of keep going from one thing to another. And, and not only don't we have any tests, we don't seem to have any kind of system of, of, of advancement. I mean, uh, uh, in, in school, you go from kindergarten to first grade to second to third, and then you graduate from, from elementary school on to middle school. You go to high school, you graduate from high school, and perhaps you go further. But in church, well, it, you know, in school, the teachers have all these kinds of, of metrics and things that they have to teach to and places where their students have to get to. But it seems like in church, a lot of time, the, the main thing that we want is that you come back next week. And our ambitions don't go a whole lot beyond that. The thing that, that, that seems to differentiate church from school an awful lot of the time, uh, I mean, we, we, we share information and knowledge, but the thing that seems to differentiate the one from the other is the whole matter of accountability and whether or not we are, are really required to, to take what is shared in a place and, and to really learn it, to put it into practice. In fact, I, I wonder if, if, if we even know if, if, if what we do here is, is kindergarten or is it graduate school. We, we don't often define what we're aiming at. And, and when we don't define that, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to hit it. And so we're taking a look this morning at, at the last words of, of Jesus to his disciples in the book of Matthew as, as he wraps things up, and, and we're, we're following kind of a, a subject-oriented sort of outline, and, and we're beginning with subject number one, history, as we take a look at Matthew 28. So often we think of the Great Commission as a standalone sort of thing for, for missionaries and, and evangelistically inclined Christians, but it happened at a place and a time that was a part of a sequence of events and as we'll see, it was part of a, a, a larger whole. Matthew 28 begins with these words, After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Which, which suggests that the Great Commission, the Great Commission isn't this piece that's, that's set aside for Mission Emphasis Sundays, but the Great Commission is a part of the resurrection story. It is of, of, of one piece with this story that starts in, in, in Matthew 28, verse 1, and goes on to talk about the women going to the tomb and seeing the angel. And then as they leave, they run into Jesus, and both the angel and Jesus tell them to go tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee. And then... And then the government steps in, and the government tries to share some disinformation, and, and, and the guards are told that they need to tell people that the disciples stole the body. And then in the very next scene, we have the disciples with Jesus in Galilee. And the, the story is told as a single story. It is a part of the resurrection story, and it is the conclusion of what happens when, when your Savior dies and comes back to life. And it's important to know that, that sequence of, of history in this chapter, how it flows from one thing to the other. And if we look at the whole story of Matthew, if you will, the history in the book of Matthew, we see where it begins with that, that genealogy that we talked about at Christmas time. And it has the visit of, of the Magi, those, those, those seers from the east, those foreigners, those people who wouldn't be accepted into the temple, it begins there, and then it ends with Jesus sending his disciples into all nations. It's, it's important to know that history. It's important to know how those parts of the story are arranged and located and are there together. If we, if we want to know what Jesus has to teach us, 
It's important to know that. And it's also important to know that throughout the the book of Matthew, if we follow Jesus through the sequence of his life, we see the way that he, he taught his disciples. And we see Jesus not huddled with the disciples in a classroom somewhere, but we see Jesus on the road. We see sermons and teachings and parables and question and answer sessions so that even as they, they learn, things that they learn, the knowledge that they get is, 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 is put into practice right out in the middle of the world where they are each and every day. The lessons of history in the, in the book of Matthew. While there's more we could say about history, we need to move on to grammar because grammar is, is crucial. I used to hate grammar. Anybody here used to hate grammar? Anybody here still hate grammar? I see some little hands way up there. Yes. That's some big hands, too. I used to hate grammar when, when, when we had it for English. I figured I knew how to speak English. I didn't need grammar. But then I, I had to study Spanish, and that didn't go so well. And then, and then it was Greek, and then Latin, and then Hebrew, and then Spanish again because it didn't go so well the first time. And, and, and when, they, when they drub grammar into you with all those different languages and all those different ways, uh, you, you either walk away and say, I can't do this, or you begin to appreciate the, the mechanics of grammar. Because once, once you see those mechanics and how they work, then you can, you can switch them from one language to another. They're like, they're like really good tools that, that help you build stuff. When, when you know how grammar works, you can put together a thought or a sentence or a paragraph or a story. And so that's why it's, it's important not only to look at, at, at history in, in a piece of scripture, but at, at grammar as well. And, and here in this passage, uh, the, the focus is on the imperative and its participles. Did you know that, well, let me ask, before I ask if you know, how many, how many commands are there in the Great Commission? Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Four, right? Actually, there's only one. There's only one imperative, only one command, and that is disciple. Make disciples. The rest of the words there are are participles, and they can be taken as commands, but but disciple is the strong command, and and the rest of the words, going, the word that goes before it, is, is kind of how it all happens. And then baptizing and teaching. Last week we saw baptizing. We had uh, Anna Van and Heuvel up here, and, and, and speaking of going, we got the whole Van and Heuvel clan to go down to the, the lower level here as they, they witnessed Anna's baptism, and we celebrated her becoming a member and belonging to Plymouth Heights Christian Reformed Church. That was the first part. That's fairly straightforward in terms of discipleship. Uh, a, a little bit of water and the promises that, that God gives to us about our belonging to him, the, the more complicated part is that, that teaching. And Jesus expressed it in this way, teaching them to, the NIV says, obey everything that I have commanded you. The, the word obey is, is an infinitive and it speaks to the purpose of the imperative. Why do you teach people? And there, there are all kinds of different reasons why we could teach people. And it seems like, like in church, often what, what we think of is that we teach people so that they can believe, which has to do with having something up here, maybe something here. But that's not the word that's used. And even with the word that's used, there's all kinds of different options on how you can translate it. One of those, those options, it's, it's a word that's used for incarceration. To keep something locked up. To keep someone locked up. To keep the commands of, of Jesus locked up. 
Or it can be used to, to mean to, to keep them a little more loosely. Maybe you have some jewels in a jewelry box at home, some, some, some jewelry. Or it can be used to express, to observe, teaching them to observe, like, oh, there's a bird flying uh, around in the sanctuary. Take a look. But the NIV has it right in, 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 in translating it here as obey. Teaching those with whom you'll con have contact to obey everything that I have commanded you. Not just to lock it up, not just to hold it in your head, not just to watch it come in one ear and go out the other, but to have your mind, your heart, your will saturated to the point where the will of God, the commands of God, they, they leak out in obedience wherever you go. And clearly the model of teaching that Jesus used was, was again, not, not that classroom setting, but an apprentice relationship. Jesus wasn't interested in what you put down on paper. He was interested in what you put down in your life and in the lives of other people. And that statement about being with us always, even to the very end, the teacher is always there. Teaching them to obey doesn't leave a lot of grammatical wiggle room. Lori and, uh, and Lupe and I went, uh, went down the, the street a, a few weeks ago when I had a Sunday morning off, the, the beginning of the polar vortex season, and, and we went to Unison Church, which is in the old Hope Reformed. It's a, a church plant of Kentwood community. And there we, we worshiped and we, we listened to the pastor there talk about the church, a, a church that uh, uh, seems to be, be growing. We were uh, excited about the, the number of people there, but, but he talked about the nature of the church and how church isn't a gathering on Sunday mornings. But church is the body of Christ out there living and breathing and worshiping and serving God each and every day of the week. Well, we need to hurry up and get through the last couple of subjects. And, and the next line is, is geography. And you know, I never caught this before, but if you, you look at a map, there's, there's something going on here. And I'm, I'm wondering if we could put that map up there. And I guess you can see it all right. On the bottom, you have Judea, and, and there you have Bethlehem and Jerusalem right above the word Judea on the bottom. And you see where Galilee is? It's way up north. And I don't know if, if, if you remember, but, but at the beginning of, of chapter 28, when the women saw the angel, and then when they saw Jesus, both the angel and Jesus told the women to tell the disciples who were all around Jerusalem to see him in Galilee. You know how far away that is? That's 80 miles. So in order for them to see Jesus, to experience face-to-face -face his resurrection, they had to travel 80 miles. They're called to make a trip of faith once again. Jesus didn't just appear. They had to make yet another pilgrimage to see him. So even before the Great Commission, Jesus is, is, is sending them out into the world. It's, it's striking that that the Jesus' resurrection and that experience of his resurrection doesn't happen there in the holy city, but that his disciples experience it out there in the workaday world, where they were fishermen, where they conducted commerce, where they did whatever it was that they had to do. That's where Jesus appeared to them. And then Jesus takes them up to a mountain. One commentator remarks that the mountaintop brings to mind the, the, the temptation with Satan's offer of all the splendid kingdoms in the world, which Jesus rejects in favor of the kingdom of heaven. It brings to mind as well the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' retreat for prayer, his healing of the crowds, his transfiguration, and the Mount of Olives. 
The mountain in Galilee brings all those things home. It was the perfect place, the perfect geography to give them these final instructions. They were reminded of places and times, of the reality, of the factuality of what Jesus had done in their midst. Okay, enough for geography. We need to wrap up with math, a little math lesson before we call it a morning. 12 minus 1 plus SD equals... Well, the first part, Jesus, Jesus does the math for you. 12 minus 1 is 11. But the unknown part of the equation is the SD. Some worshipped him, but some doubted. Our number is down to begin with. I mean, after Jesus rose from the dead, the numbers didn't immediately increase. Instead of 12, there's 11. They make this 80-mile trek up to Galilee to see Jesus, and, and we're told that they worshipped him. But at the same time, we're told that some doubted, that some weren't sure what was going on. In, in the Gospel of John, we're told it's Thomas who doubts, and, and his doubts are relieved. But here in Matthew, we're left hanging. We don't know how many are doubters, and we don't know, we don't know how their doubts are resolved. From the crowds that followed Jesus during his ministry down to 11 or, or less. And then there's the, the, the baptismal formula. 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals... You know, the church couldn't work out a, a doctrine of the Trinity for another 300 years. They struggled to articulate what that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what that meant, how how they worked together. But, but Jesus gives the command in the name of a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet not three but one. Perfect unity in threefold diversity. The perfect picture of, of the body of Christ and what it should strive for as it, it bears the image of its creator, redeemer, and sustainer in all the diversity of its membership. And finally... All plus all plus all plus all. I'm, I'm short one in the bulletin there. There are four of them. We can't finish without moving from the three persons of the Trinity to the four alls of the passage. All authority, all nations, all I have commanded you, and all the days. Only 12 people on an isolated mountaintop, standing there all alone, and Jesus says that all authority has been given to him. And not just to him, but to them. There are 12 Jews on the top of that mountain, and Jesus talks about all nations. There are 11 people who had abandoned Jesus, forsaken him, and they're commissioned to teach the whole world to obey everything he had commanded them. And Jesus, who was just about to leave them, would be with them for all the days that were to come. I'm not sure I can work the numbers or do the math, but the last 2,000 years have demonstrated that God can and does. From that mixed group of, of 11 worshipers and doubters, the message of salvation in Jesus Christ has, has reached around the globe. Nearly all countries and all people have had opportunity to hear the good news of, of God's love for this planet in and through his Son, Jesus Christ. And that message has been taken out by, by people with a passion for knowing Jesus and for making Jesus known. You know, each one of us who have been baptized, who have experienced in some way or another the, the waters into which we're both buried and washed, Every one of us is, is called to, to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. And knowing him and making him known has everything to do not with, with what we have in our heads, not with what we may guard in our hearts, not with what we do here on a Sunday morning, but it has everything to do with who we are and how we are each and every day of the week teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you.
In what we've read already this morning in that passage from Jeremiah, we see an anticipation of the Holy Spirit which, which makes that possible, which makes what was for us purely discipline into the possibility of desire as we come to know the, the life that Christ longs for us to live and invites us to, to join with him in living, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again this morning for gathering us here. We thank you for this, well, it's not an invitation, it is a command to know you and to make you known and to show that knowledge by way of obedience. Father, again, we thank you for this body of believers. We thank you for the opportunities that we're given to hold each other accountable. And we ask that you would help us to, to be concerned not just for the well-being of our sisters and brothers here, but to be concerned for their growth and their progress in what you have called us all to be, your disciples. Father, we pray all these things in the name of the one who first called us to be disciples, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.